There's a lot of confusion about how money printing, quantitative easing, and central bank money supply expansion causes a lot less inflation than one would expect after 14 years and $27 trillion of quantitative easing, as I often speak about in my monthly videos. You can see the most recent one in this video up here in the upper right hand corner. And this debate has been reduced in quality by a lot of anti-intellectual people joining in, people who don't know how much money has been printed and how far back it goes. In fact, money printing began in 2009 in the United States called quantitative easing, and to this day it continues in that form. But people think that recent inflationary blips, which are not high by any means, but just slightly higher than before, are because of money printing done during COVID-19 as though money printing only began in 2020, when in fact it has been going on since 2009. And they can endlessly adapt their excuses by saying that, well, it takes 10 years for the first QE to circulate and things like that. That's obviously not true. It doesn't help when some people also are around who believe that inflation is much higher than it is, as well as they believe that deflation would be good because they have a simplistic understanding of these things. Their understanding goes no further than a belief that inflation means I'm paying more, deflation means I'm paying less. Never mind that under deflation, your employer is more likely to deflate your salary by 100% because they reduce their workforce. But why do economists think that money printing causes inflation? Forget about conservatives and libertarians who are desperate to overstate the amount of inflation via anecdotes and things like that. To see the various tactics that they use and a debunking of each, you should look at this video up here in the upper right hand corner. Think of it this way. Economists rely on an equation called MV equals PQ. Money supply times velocity of money equals price times quantity of supply of product. Now here's the problem. In the old days, let's say the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when people had excess money, they purchased capital intensive goods, cars, houses, and so on. These were time consuming to construct. And when demand rose, then the components of each of those products had to arrive at the right time for the production of a car or construction of a house to be completed in a timely manner. And therefore, there was always going to be something that was a bottleneck that made completion harder. And therefore, you had a bidding war for prices because these being capital intensive and materially intensive goods had to rise in price in response to demand because these were materialized products. But now, we have a certain portion of the economy that is dematerialized, and this is the natural progression of technological progress. We did not have software in the 1960s and 70s that was a significant enough portion of the economy, certainly at the consumer level, to count as a percentage of what consumers bought. But here's the thing. Software has infinite supply and therefore can cater to infinite demand. If 1 million people sign up for Netflix tomorrow, Netflix does not run out of inventory. It does not raise its price. It does not have a wait list of people who can sign up to Netflix because new supply is not going to arrive for another month. And that is why a software based product does not experience inflation when its demand rises. And now software and other knowledge based products are more than 3% of the total economy, soon to be 4% as I describe in this video up here. So as demand rises, price does not rise when we're talking about high-tech products, which are increasing as a percentage of the size of the economy. Now, is that so difficult to understand? A 16-year-old child could understand what I described very easily, but PhD economists are not able to because they still go back to, well, there's this book that I was required to read when I was a doctoral student, and it was written in 1955, and it said that when money supply increases, then the large amount of money pursuing a fixed amount of goods means the price should naturally rise. Ah, but what if a certain percentage of those goods, three to 4% now, were in fact ones that could cater to unlimited supply? And remember, software does not have any shipping dimension or inventory dimension anymore. Even in the old days, while software could produce multiple copies, 
it still had to be shipped to retail stores. People purchased boxed software packages from electronics retail stores. And not only has boxed software gone away, but that's one of the factors that has also made electronics retailers go away because there's no margin to be made on selling software in a box in stores. You just download software that you want to buy, whether it's a video game, whether it's an enterprise software package, whether it's some new AI tool, you either download it or you have software as a service subscription. And as this percentage keeps rising from three to 4% and soon to be 8%, 16% as we progress over the next several years and decades, we will see more and more of this effect in place and therefore money supply can be increased at an exponential rate because of the greater increase of the portion of the economy that cannot experience inflation from unlimited demand because software and other knowledge-based products can cater to virtually unlimited demand. And there's a continuum. A semiconductor chip is not software. You still have to produce individual units, but instead of being 100% knowledge like software, it is 95% knowledge in that the price of it is almost entirely in the knowledge that went into the circuit design and the chipset production at the fabrication facility. So while those do have to be shipped and so forth, their price relative to their weight is very, very lopsided relative to commodity type goods, including gold. And therefore you will not see price increases based on too much money chasing too few chips. Only occasionally are there extreme shortages in a specialized type of chip like the NVIDIA GPU, but those are infrequent instances in the history of semiconductors. Knowledge-based goods are inherently deflationary because they can cater to unlimited demand because their supply can expand to meet any amount of demand. Think of a metaphor. Even 35 years ago or so, if you wanted to write letters, you had to write them and send them individually in the mail. If you wanted to send the same letter generically to multiple recipients, you still had to make photocopies of it and send them in individual envelopes. Now you can send an email to multiple people. You can do it in BCC, so the recipients don't know who the other recipients are. You can add attachments to them. So now you can add a deck or a document or a PDF file or something as an attachment. When exactly did that begin? People don't even remember the first time they sent an attachment but now you can send documents to multiple recipients. You can even use automation software like Mail Merge to send somewhat customized letters to a very large number of recipients, 1,000 recipients, 5,000 recipients if needed. These technologies are being abused quite a bit as well because all of us keep getting on mailing lists that we do not want to be on. But this example describes the economies of scale that we experience in the high-tech age in a dematerialized knowledge-based economy. And that is why money printing has a certain elasticity of demand where supply can match that demand and therefore money printing causes much, much less inflation than one would think. This is very obvious to anyone who thinks about it and who thinks about how software works or even better has made money from the production of software, but it's extremely confusing to economists who believe that textbooks written in the 1950s and 60s or even earlier are somehow similar to the laws of physics in that they cannot really change all that frequently, when in fact the high-tech age has shown us quite the opposite. Thank you very much for watching.